Yes, you were speaking um, to us about um, hospitals worried about having um, a large number of people coming in um, with the with them needing special care and whatnot. Could you elaborate on that, please? Right. So that's. Um, Basically, what we're looking at and expectations for this virus is we know that out of the population, we are expecting anywhere between 30 to 70% of the population will be infected um, with COVID-19. 80% of those people will have mild to no symptoms. So most people who actually will be exposed to the virus will be fine. They may have cold or flu-like symptoms, um, but they or may have be completely asymptomatic and will recover. Um, 20% of those people, however, will need hospitalization um, with more um, um, severe symptoms requiring um, uh, management in hospital. And 5% of those people actually will require more um, intensive care, potentially um, ventilation or, or need to be in the intensive care unit. But if you actually map out those numbers, um, that's actually a lot higher than our hospital capacity which has been, been, you know, the hospitals have been preparing and building up um, for those capacities, but mm -hmm. we're hoping with a lot of the physical distancing and the flattening of the curb is that those numbers will drop so that um, we will be able to maintain capacity in the hospitals over a longer period of time, rather than getting them all coming in at a peak all at once. And just in case at the worst case scenario, if we do face the chance of a lot of people coming in and we're at that peak, what kind of measures have you guys been looking at? Like, are we going to set up emergency hospitals? I know hospitals are increasing their capacity, but is there anything else that we're looking at really? Um, I think uh, a lot of hospitals and a lot of provinces are preparing in their own way and they mm -hmm. all have different um, um, capacity measures that they're preparing for. I know there's a lot of resource modeling that's happening based on different scenarios, um, based on, you know, the more conservative scenario versus the um, the worst scenario um, possible. So there is a lot of movement happening within hospitals, um, within communities, within clinics. Um, you know, there's a lot of doctors being called up to the front lines and mm -hmm. other healthcare workers as well um, to be on backup. There are, um, uh, you know, a non-essential um, or non-urgent um, medical care is being um, put on hold or pushed um, outwards um, so that it'll free up space within the hospitals, for example, non-urgent mm -hmm. uh, surgeries and that type of thing are being held off so that um, uh, operating rooms and those types of um, rooms are there's more space available, more personnel available. Um, and I know that there is also um, um, uh, hospitals looking at just increasing um, equipment that they have available. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so there is a lot happening. And, um, you know, I can't speak to the specifics because it'll be happening differently based on what each hospital um, requires and what they're expected. But a lot of um, uh, cities are working kind of within their health service. Uh, usually they all have like an umbrella health service and under public health services as well. Um, there's a lot of direction happening from that. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, now, I know that health um, healthcare workers and a lot of people in our healthcare system have been um, not, I will say maybe sometimes taking for granted, but right now the world, the whole world view kind of shifts and you guys became the heroes. Um, but it's very important for us that you guys stay safe as well because you are the frontline workers and you are the people who are gonna have to, um, I mean, most of the um, people around our community outside are self-distancing, staying at home, following all of the um, advices and tips that we're getting, but you can't do that. You're still out there kind of fighting the fight. How is the feel in the medical community within your, your uh, coworkers, within your team? How is the morale there? What is the feel? What is the vibe? Well, first of all, I think if you talk to a lot of healthcare workers, we'll just tell you we're just doing our job. So um, we're really not the heroes in this. Actually, the heroes are the, the people in the community, the people who are following the measures necessary um, for the social distancing and the physical distancing, and really the ones um, uh, promoting that message to stay home um, and to um, you know wash your hands, because that is actually um, what's going to make the difference in the end from a public health level. Um, within 
the the morale though for um, healthcare workers, I think it's a bit of a mixed feeling for everybody. Um, there is a lot of appreciation, obviously, from, you know, and, and a lot of support coming from the community. I mean, there's people bringing free coffee and there's, you know, access to that type of thing. But I think there's also a bit of, um, there's anxiety um, and there's fear and there's um, uh, a little bit of, of a sense that we are about to go into battle against something that we don't know very much about um, that we haven't seen before. Um, and as well, there's also that concern that maybe we are about to go into battle without the proper um, ammo and without um, having the proper equipment to be that. So there is that, that sense of um, anxiety within it. However, at the same time, there is also um, a lot of teamwork and a lot of preparation and a lot of training, a lot of expertise, um, and also a lot of teamwork because it's not just doctors, it's nurses, it's the cleaners, it's the respiratory therapists, um, you know, it's, it's um, the people working in the community to make sure that, you know, people are still having access to other medical conditions that are still happening. So, um, you know, there's a lot of um, extra work that's going into it. Um, but I think the other concern that people have in the healthcare side of thing is yes, um, you know, we are being potentially exposed to this virus um, and we are probably in, in a position to be transmitting it unknowingly to our family members. Um, and so there is that concern as well, where a lot of health work workers feel that, um, you know, when they come home, they want to make sure that they're not bringing any of the virus home. Um, and that they, uh, there are a lot of people who are working on the front lines who are distancing themselves from their family or staying in separate locations from their family just to decrease the risk of them bringing it home to vulnerable family members such as um, those who are elderly or those who may be sick um, already within the family who would be at a higher risk of having a more complicated course of the disease. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and I know it can be very difficult, especially coming home to your family when you have younger children or people who are at risk to actually make sure that you're keeping them safe. But we would like to thank you for all of the hard work that you guys are doing. Thanks. Now, I do have um, a couple of more technical questions that a lot of our audience did submit here for us. Um, now, one thing I picked up on when you were talking is that you said there is a little bit of anxiety and fear to kind of go into a battle a little bit unprepared or out of of ammo. Um, how do you feel that we are prepared for the worst? Um, I think in Canada, uh, we have some experience in regards to we went through um, something like SARS back in, in the early 2000s. So there is a little bit more preparation um, in regards to kind of pandemic type planning. Mm -hmm. um, that also being said that we have some phenomenal leaders um, in public health and infectious diseases and emergency medicine and in critical care across Canada. And I think those people are really leading um, the teaching, the training, the preparation um, in, in having those um, potential worst case scenarios. And I think that there is also a lot of rallying behind the medical community as well now from the government um, and the community in regards to, um, you know, declaring a state of emergency, declaring um, the need for um, um, trying to get enough um, protective, um, personal protective equipment um, and the necessary um, equipment needed within the hospitals. So, um, it's hard to say because we don't know exactly um, what um, the numbers are going to look like um, mm -hmm. just yet. And we'll have a better idea in the next week or two of how um, effective um, the physical distancing um, it has been in actually flattening our curve. Um, and so um, that will just... Um, we are prepared for the worst, but hope for the best. <laughs> inshallah ta'ala, inshallah. Now, um, some of the questions that we did have from um, a couple of the um, community members, one of them in particular, I think comes, hits close home, especially for us here in Al Rashid, and it's about ghusl in particular for funerals. Mm -hmm. Now, um, because this is a new disease and um, a lot of information may be clear or not clear really um, about 
does it transmit after a person passes away? Do you need to go through the full procedure of Ghusl? What really happens when you do have somebody passes away out of from COVID-19 and we need to bury them? In your recommendation, what is the best procedure to follow? Um, so the issue with COVID-19 is that we don't actually have a lot of information yet um, mm -hmm. in regards to the specific details of transmissibility and infectivity and knowing how long um, and the infectivity or transmissibility can be before someone becomes trans um, symptomatic, while they're asymptomatic, um, and even potentially um, afterwards. So, um, you know, there's averages and there's medians and even from based on the incubation periods that we see, um, we know that there are potentially have been cases where there's asymptomatic viral transmission, pre-symptomatic uh, viral transmission, um, and potentially um, viral shedding um, in, in people who've had um, COVID-19 who, um, you know, maybe and shedding even up to 20 to 30 days later. However, that might not be at a potential infectious level. Um, we know that the virus is in respiratory secretions and other bodily fluids, um, potentially of, um, um, of, um, of, of human. And we also know that um, potential the viral load will be higher in somebody who has a severe illness. So mm -hmm. if somebody dies from COVID, we assume that the viral load will be higher in that person. And so it would be necessary to take the um, precautions of anybody who is handling um, the body um, to ensure that that virus and those bodily secretions are um, aren't transmitted to anybody who would be handling the body. Now, I assume that there, and I, I have seen guidelines from the National Funeral Directors Association and, and, and different guidelines um, that I've been seeing, but the key thing would be that anybody who comes in contact with the body mm -hmm. should be in full protective gear. So they should have protective, um, personal protective equipment, um, which would include um, uh, a mask, a shield, a gown, and gloves. Um, anybody who is handling the body, anybody who is washing the body. Now, and the key thing with that is that knowing that the droplets are, uh, virus is spread in droplet form, the droplets would be from places like the eye, the nose, uh, the mouth, and potentially the private parts as well. So um, uh, ensuring, um, you know, low pressure in washing the body would be necessary to decrease um, risk of splatter to potential people involved with the <laughs> whistle um, to decrease that transmission. The other point to make is that the the procedure even coming out of the gusso for the people who are involved, it is very important that they understand and follow the protocols to take off the equipment properly so that they don't contaminate themselves while they're taking off that equipment. Um, and um, to note that anywhere the body um, potentially has touched that that room or that place should be um, disinfected um, and left for at least an hour after disinfection. Um, the other thing to note is that um, I know that people who are involved um, with the whistle, even if they're wearing the protective equipment, um, obviously they would be wearing clothes and whatnot um, underneath. It is best to try to, to change those clothes, put them in a plastic bag, um, and when they come home, to have that washed in hot water as soon as possible, and for that individual to take um, a shower um, to make sure that they are um, um, uh, like washed from any potential exposure to the virus. Okay, so pretty much just taking full measures, go all the way out in kind of prevention and protecting yourself when you are dealing with the body, especially those who will be doing the OSA. For sure. For, and, the, and as the same thing is, um, you know, once um, even p potentially people, any, any contact that there would be with any of the body, even um, from transferring in, into the grave, anyone who's going to be in contact um, should be wearing protective measures um, um, to decrease um, um, 
transmission um, and contact with potential virus. Okay. Now we know from um, watching the news and following everything that is happening with COVID-19 that usually if somebody is, um, has been, um, like it confirmed to be carrying COVID-19 or tested positive, their family member and people who are around them usually either get tested or go into self-isolation right away. Now, when we do have somebody that did pass away from COVID-19, what is the best recommendation for the family? Because in theory, they should be getting tested in self-isolation and whatnot, but they need to be present for the funeral. What is the best recommendation you can make in that kind of situation? So, um, unfortunately, one of the things um, because of COVID-19 is that there have been really strict regulations for, to visitors and family um, into the hospitals um, to decrease that um, risk of transmission. Mm -hmm. um, so often, um, family members who might be quite ill in the hospital might have not have access to family members. Um, it would be best, obviously, if, if you are actually have been in contact or living with somebody who has tested positive to call um, public health um, and have that discussion with them because they would direct you as to whether or not you need to be tested or whatnot. Regardless, anyone who has been in contact um, with anyone who's positive for COVID should be um, in um, self-isolation for at least 14 days where they would be monitoring themselves um, to develop symptoms. Um, public health would uh, be the best ones to guide to see whether or not they would be tested um, because the testing regulations may vary from province to province. Um, um, however, regardless that those persons should be um, kept um, self-isolated um, and self-monitoring for potential development of symptoms as well. Um, and if they were to develop symptoms, they should be self-isolating from the onset of their symptoms okay. um, for at least uh, 10 to 14 days, depending on the regulations per province. Um, it, it is difficult because, um, you know, those people, the family members may want to um, come to the funeral, um, be at the funeral. And I, and I think um, that discussion would have to be made um, based on, um, you know, with public health and case by case, if they were asymptomatic, um, it would be um, generally okay for them to be present, uh, ensuring that anyone at the funeral is physically distancing by two meters, um, avoiding, um, you know, unfortunately avoiding hugging um, and close contact and, and physical contact um, with other members of the family. So the funeral people should be spaced out by two meters at least. And we know that because we know that respiratory droplets um, can be spread by coughing, by sneezing, by talking, and they tend to be at, at up to two meters um, in, in the distance that they can travel. And so potentially if someone's been in contact with somebody who's positive, um, they may be shedding the virus asymptomatically. Um, and so that would be necessary to keep those precautions. Now, if somebody was in contact with somebody who was positive and was symptomatic, it is advised that they not come to the funeral, they should self-isolate. Um, and contact their health provider or public health accordingly. Okay. Now, a lot of talk is about public health and we have the phone number, but I think there's a lot of confusion what actually happens once you call public health. Like in reality, on the ground, first of all, when should you call public health? What kind of symptoms do you need to see in yourself to, before you call public health? And what happens after you make that phone call? Does everybody get tested or is there a specific procedure or recommendation after it happens? Like in reality, what really happens once you call public health? So um, I think it'll vary based on province to province. I know a lot of um, health services are providing self-assessment tools instead of coming having the call where they can kind of guide you. So if you are having actually more severe symptoms where you're having difficulty um, breathing, uh, difficulty walking because you are short of breath, um, come severe weakness, um, though that would be a call to 911, obviously. Mm -hmm. Anything a little bit less severe than that um, where you're not sure what to do or you potentially have um, been in in contact with somebody positive and now you're having symptoms or if you've traveled in the last 14 days and now you're having symptoms that would be another indication to call public health um, so when you say symptoms what do you mean exactly so um, symptoms can range from fever cough shortness of breath runny nose sore throat chest pain and congestion nausea diarrhea 
loss of sensation of, of, of taste or smell, mm -hmm. um, abdominal pain. Um, so specifically people who have those symptoms after travel or have been contact should definitely be calling public health. The other option is to call telehealth, to call your family physician virtually, and they might help guide you. If your symptoms are a little bit more mild and you don't have any of the bigger risk factors, they may just at least explain to you the process for self-isolation, meaning you self-isolate um, and up to 14 days um, or um, until you're symptomatic for 48 hours um, after self-isolation. And if your symptoms get worse, mm -hmm. then to seek medical attention. Okay. And now when you call the public health providers, what happens after? So um, they will guide you in regards to whether they um, they may tell you to you just need to self isolate and mm -hmm. monitor at home. They may advise you to go to the emergency. Um, they may advise you to follow up with your family physician as this may not be related to COVID. Um, they may advise you to go to a COVID assessing as assessment testing center, um, depending on whether you qualify for testing. Now, I don't know about the testing criteria in Alberta. I believe it might be broader, but for Ontario currently, um, we are only testing um, people who are deemed to be high transmitters. So for example, if you are working in an occupation where you are working with a population where potentially may be vulnerable as your job, you can transmit to them. So healthcare workers, people working in daycares and schools, um, potentially grocery workers, mm -hmm. um, potentially um, people working in nursing homes, retirement homes, long-term care facilities, prisons, um, fire brigade, paramedics, um, anybody who's working with um, a population where they potentially could be transmitting it through their job would be tested. The other would be category that we're testing for are people who live in a residence where there can be high transmission. So people for a home, living in a nursing home, living in a prison, mm -hmm. living in, in any of these um, um, uh, residences where it's shared capacity and there's risk for multiple people having an outbreak from, um, from, from transmission. Those would be considered tested as well. And then of course, there's the category that we would get from public health, um, where if public health has advised you to be tested um, for whatever reason, because you're high risk because of potential contact or mm -hmm. potential high risk because of potential travel, um, public health may advise you to go in to get to get tested as well. Okay. Now we have a question here. Um, I was wondering if you can please get some more information about how long COVID-19 is transmissible. If I get it and have no symptoms, how long will I be contagious to other people? If I get it and have symptoms, then how long is it contagious to other people? So having symptoms and not versus not having symptoms, how still how contagious are you to other people? Um, and what do you think the amount of people um, are that will have symptoms compared to those that won't? Right. So we know out of the population who will get COVID-19, which we're, like I said, expecting between 30 to 70 percent of the population. Mm -hmm. um, 80% of those will have no symptoms to mild symptoms, okay, um, where they will not need hospitalization. So cold, flu-like symptoms, including fever, sh um, shortness of mild shortness of breath, cough, sore throat, runny nose, um, maybe some nausea, some diarrhea, some weakness. Um, so those are the people um, we don't, I mean, obviously the specifics of the, who's asymptomatic um, versus who might have mild symptoms. We don't know the exact numbers of that. Um, the actual transmissibility and infectivity um, timeframe, we actually don't know the exact numbers. We know the incubation period um, is up to 14 days. So most people, so incubation period means the, the period where you've been exposed to the virus, but you have not yet developed symptoms. Most people will develop symptoms between two to 14 days with an average of people developing symptoms at five days post exposure. Okay, so if you've been exposed to somebody and you're asymptomatic, 
we don't know um, exactly, but we know that there are cases where you can be transmitting that virus asymptomatically. And that's one of the key components um, of, of uh, physical distancing. If you have mild symptoms, okay, so fever, cough, runny nose, sore throat, headache, muscle aches, fatigue, those types of things, we know that the virus is likely to be more contagious earlier on in your symptoms. So for example, for the first few days that you may have those, even like a little bit of a runny nose or a cough, you might actually be more contagious in those first few days, um, up to seven days potentially, if not more. Um, and so it is really important that if you have any mild symptoms at all, even a mild runny nose, a mild cough, mild sore throat, it is so imperative that you self-isolate um, from others around you. You do not go out, you do not go to work, you do not um, 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 interact with especially people who potentially could have a more complicated course, um, such as elderly people who might have a chronic medical condition or immunocompromised. So um, that is actually um, with the recommendation is if you develop symptoms to self-isolate for 14 days or uh, at least until um, 48 hours after you're asymptomatic. Okay, that makes sense. Now, um, I do have another question for you. If somebody gets infected with COVID-19 and they do recover, are they likely, does that mean they have built immunity towards the virus? Can, if it, can they actually pick up the virus again? So again, um, we don't have concrete information on that yet. It is okay. being looked at um, and it is being studied. Um, there um, is some suggestion right now that um, there will be um, some um, um, some immunity to it. Again, whether um, you can have uh, the virus um, again, there have been reports of people who have um, had COVID-19, um, had tested negative, and then um, have tested positive again when they've become symptomatic later. Um, so um, again, we don't know whether or not that was just because they're still potentially shedding the virus from the initial infection and that's what's been picked up. That is something that is being looked at. Um, they are um, doing studies now um, to look at um, serology levels, um, checking for immunity um, in patients um, who have been potentially exposed. Um, and I know there's also studies that looking potentially for people who have been asymptomatic and mild. So that is something um, we don't know the full information yet. Um, uh, but it is being looked at by the experts. Okay, that makes sense. I have some questions here on social media. One of them says, um, can I go see my parents and wear protection? Um, it is advised if um, you are not um, kind of living with them and if you have been kind of out uh, interacting um, with anywhere where you potentially could have been exposed to it, including in grocery stores and whatnot, to avoid um, um, seeing your parents, especially if they are, um, you know, um, like elderly or potentially immunocompromised. That being said, um, you know, if they need help, if they need food, um, you know, uh, in that regard, it, if you have no symptoms um, and you can, can guarantee that you will be like physically distanced from them, there's no harm in going to um, make sure that they have uh, adequate food available and whatnot. Um, but it is advised not to be kind of going for a social visit um, kind of at this time. Okay. Um, and now we do have a lot of questions about sanitization and disinfecting, because I think this is a big topic right now. Um, one of them is, says, are services uh, steamed cleaned at 345 Fahrenheit considered sanitized? What kind of sanitizers can you make at home, considering they're not available in the market right now? Um, so I know the CDC uh, does re recommend, um, there's like a list on the CDC website um, as to different uh, um, um, 
uh, disinfectants that they kind of recommend. The one that is recommended to that you can make at home is using a bleach solution. So a diluted bleach solution. So you'd use basically um, four to five teaspoons of bleach in a quart of water. And you could use that kind of in a spray bottle um, and spraying on your surfaces, leaving it on for several minutes and then washing that off. Just a caveat with that, I would just make sure that, you know, you do a test spot on certain surfaces to make sure that it doesn't ruin the surfaces. Um, children are not close by at all. Yeah, so it is kind of better to, to if available, to use, um, you know, the, so that's one option to make at home. Um, you can use potentially like commercially um, bought disinfectants, um, which are readily available um, in, in different places, and you might have to source that. Um, but otherwise, I know the CDC has a list, and that would be the recommendation for um, a homemade uh, solution that can be used as a disinfectant for home. Um, the... This the three the, you said the steam clean disinfecting. Yeah. Like, are we talking about like floors type of thing? I'm assuming. So I'm assuming if it's if it's at such a high degree, then uh, the the COVID nineteen wouldn't be stable at uh, such a high temperature. And so yes, um, there would probably be some um, disinfection um, if you're steam cleaning at that temperature for sure. Okay. It's the same thing we recommend that um, you're washing your clothes in the warmest temperature, hottest temperature possible um, with the regular detergents. We know that that will kill most viruses. Um, and um, so similarly would be. Um, kind of the same thing with the steam cleaning. Okay. Um, we have a question from Brother Tessier on Facebook. Um, now we know that COVID-19 um, really attacks for the most part your respiratory system and that's where the big risk is, but does it damage any other organs that, than your lungs? Um, absolutely. So um, we know that um, uh, generally, the biggest thing it can cause is, yes, respiratory um, failure, but um, we know that the more severe cases, what we get is something called like a cytokine um, storm type syndrome, where you get this um, uh, inflammation um, of, of um, the, uh, the within the body, and it can lead to multi-organ um, failure, um, leading to what we call a shock syndrome um, that would require, um, um, you know, um, oxygenation through uh, what we call an ECMO machine where the, it, you know, different organs start shutting down because of the lack of oxygen um, or the overload of inflammation. And so definitely um, it can affect other organs based on that. Um, the other thing to note is people who potentially already have a chronic comorbidity, such as a heart condition or a kidney condition or immunosuppressed in any way, those potential um, conditions can be um, made worse um, or exacerbated um, uh, from the virus itself. So definitely other parts of the, the body can be affected as secondary, um, usually to um, the lack of oxygen that, that results to an acute respiratory distress type syndrome that we see um, in, in COVID-19. Okay. Now, going back to sanitization and hand sanitizer and whatnot, I think many people have been using them so much that right now they're kind of causing eczema or allergies, or they're, they're just not very um, soft on the skin. Let's just say that. Is there any kind of hand creams that you recommend or any kind of alternatives that you would recommend to just keep our hands um, in a good physical condition? Um, so the best is soap and water. Okay. Um, soap and water, washing your hands for at least 20 seconds. Um, it's so replacing sa like a hand sanitizer with soap and water. You mean. Yeah. So washing okay. your hands with soap and water um, might decrease the amount that it's being dried up. Um, usually with alcohol sanitizers um, that are recommended, it's at least 60% of the alcohol within the sanitizer. Um, and it can be quite drying on the hands. So if people are finding that the sanitizer is, is, is quite drying, you're better off maybe just using um, a good soap and water and then kind of moisturizing after you have washed your hands. Um, obviously, with any moisturizer. I mean, it's going to be a preference for different people, but um, there are um, eczema brands um, that are a little bit more for sensitive skin. Um, you want to be using um, any lotion that potentially is a bit thicker, what we call emollient, um, trying to avoid anything with scents or colors. Mm -hmm. 
um, are going to be a little bit more effective in sealing that moisture in. And the best time to moisturize is going to be right after you washed your hands so that you seal in any of the moisture. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and now, this is a question from one of our audience too. Could the virus be suspended into the atmosphere, um, as some say, another conspiracy theory? <laughs> So we know that um, the virus is not airborne. Yeah. Um, so we, it is, um, we call uh, droplet in contact. So respiratory droplets um, can be um, as a result of coughing, sneezing, talking, laughing. We know that these droplets can um, uh, travel up to two meters um, or six feet. Um, and so some people will say that these droplets are suspended in the air to do so. Um, it does not make it airborne. So an example of an airborne um, disease would be something like uh, tuberculosis. And the difference is that is going to be the size of the um, 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 aerosol, uh, uh, what we call aerosolization of the, the droplet. So we know for sure that COVID-19 is not airborne and it mm -hmm. is uh, a, um, a, from respiratory secretion and droplets. Um, there was a study that came out looking at um, you know, the, the length of time for aerosolization um, of, um, of those droplets in the air. Um, again, that study um, was shown and it was, um, um, the aerosolization was created. Um, and so in that study, it was shown that potentially um, it could stay um, in the in the air for three hours. But again, that is was a study that was, um, it was a creation of the aerosolization. So it's not actually what we're seeing in regards to um, transmission. So transmission is actually through droplets. So it's not going to be airborne. Um, that being said, those droplets can stay on surfaces for long periods. Okay. So those, and that's where we see the, the infection happening, where people are touching like a door or they're touching, you know, things in the public um, and then they're touching their nose or their eyes or their face. And that's how we're seeing transmission. So um, the, the droplets can stay on surfaces, depending on the type of surface, anywhere between a few hours to many days. Mm. Um, and so that is gonna be um, the key point to making sure that surfaces are disinfected frequently that are used often. So things like bathroom, kitchen, doorknobs. When you come home from outside, making sure you're washing your hands immediately because you don't know, um, you know what you've touched. If you've gone to the grocery store, you might have touched a door handle. Someone might have coughed or sneezed on that. Um, you don't know, you know how many people have picked up those vegetables to look at them. So um, how much contact there might be on that. So, you know, making sure that you come home, avoiding touching your face as much as possible when you're out washing your hands to decrease the risk of transmission. So no um, airborne um, transmission. We know that there are in the hospital, the recommendation is to use that what we call the N95 masks, which filter um, airborne particles but those are only recommended for what we call aerosolizing generating procedures. So healthcare workers are at risk of aerosolized droplets from certain procedures that they are doing mm -hmm. in the hospital that is causing it to be aerosolized. So things like intubating or suctioning or other procedures. And that's what makes it a, a higher risk for healthcare providers. And that's why they're recommended to wear that mask um, versus um, other people who are being exposed, just the surgical mask to decrease the, the contact drop. Okay. I'm not sure if you're the right person to ask this question too, but where are we looking in, into vaccinations? Are we partnering with any other country into kind of looking at vaccine options right now? or vaccine research? There is a lot of funding um, going into vaccine research. Um, and there is definitely a lot of movement um, all around the world in regards to looking um, at vaccine development. Um, and I know um, there is work being done on that. So um, I don't know in the regards to us specifically partnering in different places. I know there's a lot of different um, institutions and research organizations that are putting a lot of money into that and are having a lot of their expertise working on that right now. Um, so that is in the works currently. Um, uh, of course, um, I'll hear about it as soon as at the same time as you guys hear about it, I'm sure. Um, and we'll hear about it from the experts as it's being developed.
Okay, that's great to hear. Um, now, my last question from the audience that I have here is, is chlorine, like in swimming pools, um, can, can chlorine in swimming pools carry the virus or does it kill it? Um, the chlorine will kill it. So swimming pools, the chlorine, as, as long as the swimming pool is, uh, is adequately treated with the chlorine, like it's not under treated, um, it, it would definitely um, uh, kill, uh, kill the virus in hot tubs and swimming pools as long as it's being adequately treated with chlorine. Okay, but we're not recommending that people go to public pools. They need to stay at home and um, practice social distancing, right? I, I believe that none of the public pools are open at the moment. Yeah, that's very um, true. And, and the reason for that is potentially the uh, transmission exposure that you can get from outside the pool um, and from person to person. Okay. Now, as a person who does work in the um, front line, I know when you go home, there's a lot of things that you do um, with, from washing your hands, changing your clothes and whatnot. Is there a best recommendation for um, people who are still going to their jobs, coming home to their families on what should they do when they come home? Like what is an extreme measure and what is something that really has to be done? Um so as much as possible, um, I, for example, for myself is I, when I go to work, I change um, and I have a different set of clothes that I am wearing, like I'm wearing scrubs at work. Um, and um, then I, I change back into my outside clothes coming out um, when I come home. Um, when I do come home, the first thing I do is wash my hands and then I go, I put my clothes basically um, to wash and, and, and shower from head to toe, um, just because of potential exposure even um, in, in public. Um, for those people who don't um, work in a potential where they, where they can't potentially have a different set of clothes um, at work, um, probably the same measure would be to come home um, and to um, before kind of meeting with your family and whatnot, wash your hands, um, you know, have an area where you can take, um, where you can take your clothes um, off and put them in the laundry right away. Um, and then obviously um, try to have um, a shower um, and before you, you go to meet your family and um, before you kind of interact in or uh, proceed into the rest of the house. Okay, that makes sense. We'll, we'll try to keep your notes and your advices in mind. Um, is there any last message or any last note that you will send to our community here in Edmonton on all over Canada? Um, I think part of it is that it's, it's, it's difficult for people um, with physical um, distancing. And I understand that it's very difficult as well, um, you know, not seeing your kids or your grandkids or your parents. Um, um, I think the key thing is that knowing that you are doing this for the greater good um, and what you are doing by staying home is actually making a huge difference on the community um, and the national level, um, as well as kind of with your health with the healthcare system that's there to be able to provide care, not only for people who um, have COVID, but also to allow the capacity to continue for care for people who have non COVID related medical issues. So you're allowing that by um, following the, um, um, the recommendations by public health, by, by physically distancing. The other thing to note is that, you know, and one of the reasons why they changed it from social distancing to physical distancing is that physical distancing doesn't mean social distancing. Um, it doesn't mean because there is a lot of potential risk for social isolation. Um, and so making sure that you are checking in on your neighbor, um, wh by the, whether it's a phone call or whether it's a Zoom call, um, you know, there's a lot of um, innovative ways that people are, are coming up with things, everything from I went to my first virtual wedding last week um to um you know uh house um uh house zoom calls so um and people even doing um for example um prayer salah prayer on like a um on a, a a virtual forum so that you don't feel that you're doing it by yourself potentially so um yeah, it, we don't know um, time frame right now um but i think um what people need to understand is that um um Unfortunately, what we're dealing with is, is quite serious. Um, and a lot of people um, may not actually um, be um, personally um, affected by um, the virus, but the, the um, 
the action that you take to stay home will actually have a, a huge ripple effect um, in the community and on the healthcare. So um, just know just by staying home that you are actually making a huge difference and potentially could be saving someone's life. Inshallah ta'ala. Jazakallah khair, doctor. We thank you so much for joining us today and all of the good information. Um, we wish you to stay healthy and keep fighting the fight. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you the power and the will. And inshallah, we can overcome this together. Thank inshallah. you very much. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum.